Okay, um, we're going to continue with our discussion of Alejo Carpentier, our Cuban magical realist today. As you recall, we rushed through both of his essays in our Magical Realist Anthology, and I pointed out several references of his in his second essay, The Baroque and the, Mag and the Marvelous Real, several references to places and artifacts in Mexico that are Baroque. And because we've already done a little looking at the New World Baroque with uh, Garcia Marquez with the angels and saints, and because also you're facing your web project, um, I want to uh, show you a few of the sites to which he refers. I don't have all of them, but if you brought your anthology, you'll recall it's on page 98, 99, and 100, where he makes a very particular listing of the sites that he saw, would have seen on his many trips to Mexico, but as I think I've mentioned, in 1926 as a young man, age 22, he went to Mexico and really began to devise his theory of lo real maravilloso and then the Baroque as well, that theory of syncretic, mixing, symbiotic, mestizo culture that is Latin America, according to the Cuban uh, Alejo Carpentier. So let me just show you, it's starting on the bottom of, I, I've, re I've arranged my slides in a little different order than this order that he provides. So just, uh, we'll look at this, the, the references in particular, but let's just look at these as they come up and then we'll relate them to his text. Remember that he mentions the Popol Vuh. Now, you may not, and the Chilam Balam, the middle of page 98, these are indigenous texts. Actually, the Popol Vuh written after the conquest. It's the sacred book of the Quiche Maya, Guatemalan area. Um, and there's, there is some illustration, but what I want to show you, because he mentions the painted books in other essays, are the pre-Hispanic painted books of Mexico called codices. A codex, C-O-D-E-X, is an unbound folio, and that's really not accurate because these images come from fragmentary text that survives somehow the conquest. Many, many were burned. But there's an elaborate writing system here, and I'm not going to go on about it, but uh, here's another page of this same codex called the Borgia, which is from the Central Highlands area of Mexico. And you can imagine that when Carpentier is talking about the Baroque, he's talking about the incredible complexity of culture in Latin America. He would refer to the, these amazing pre-Hispanic texts. This is a particular style. There are three only that survive from the Maya area pre-Hispanic, pre-conquest. There are more from the highlands, the area around Mexico City. This is called the Mixteca Puebla style. As you know, there's a city named Puebla. And there are huge books de devoted to, and scholarship devoted to these painted books, as the, as the Spaniards called them when they arrived. The dots, the figures, you see on the left, lower left, our lower left hand corner there, an elaborate iconography that people have, anthropologists and archaeologists have decoded. Um, I'm interested in, that, in these because they get picked up again in post-revolutionary Mexico. Diego Rivera paints some of these images into his murals as a celebration of pre-Hispanic heritage. See that little fellow is being poked on the bottom of the page, the slide, uh, poked with a, what's called dardo, they call it a, a, a dart. This is a Venus table, and Venus is considered to be dangerous. This fellow is being injured. There's all kinds of astrology and astronomy and wisdom in these texts. So you saw three from the Borgia. This one, as you see, they, they bear European names. The three 
Maya codices are called the Paris, the Dresden, and the Madrid because it's named after the libraries where they ended up in. This one, as you see, the four corners of the Me Mexica universe. By Mexica, I mean Aztec. Aztec is a word that was invented later to describe the group that Cortes encountered in 1521. But again, you see the complexity of this world view. These are divinatory texts. They're written by priests who are also artists, painters. They performed the text. They read them aloud. It wasn't as if everyone had access. This was uh, you, the upper classes of uh, the culture who had access. Now, you'll remember that he also mentions Te Pozzo Lan. No, I don't think he mentions it by name, but we're going to leave the pre-Hispanic and go to the high Baroque. And I just wanted to show you some facades. I don't think he does mention Teotihuacan. The one he mentions on page 100 is the Oh, yeah, yes, he does. I'm sorry. It's about, on page 100, it's about eight lines down, Tepotzotlan. This is now the Vice Regal Museum of Mexico. It's outside of Mexico City. It was a Jesuit seminary. The Jesuits were the purveyors of the Baroque in the New World, um, built enormously elaborate buildings. The Jesuits were the educators of the sons of the wealthy. They had plenty of money. And what the, Bar the Baroque for them was important. Here's another picture of the same facade. Look how gorgeous it is. And as a museum, it's just stunning. You, you go in and well, I'll show you the interior of the church. But beside all of these churches in the 17th and 18th centuries was a square, which was the, con the monastery, where the, the Jesuits or the Augustinians or the uh, Franciscans lived, and now that whole area is occupied by masterworks of colonial art. So I recommend Tepozotlan. It's called San Javier, San Francisco Javier de Tepozotlan. Uh, always in Mexico, the indigenous name of the place is kept, and of course, a saint's name or a virgin is put in, in front of it. So uh, this is, we, but it's popularly known as Tepozotlan. Um, I'm going to, look at this as the interior. This is the kind of Baroque that Carpentier is talking about because it accommodates everything. He says, ah, the, uh, the idols hide behind the altars. It's not his phrase, it's someone else's. But the Baroque becomes a way in which 20th century theorists of Latin American identity, and Carpentier is first among them, the Baroque becomes useful because that's a way to include everything. So the artisans who worked upon these amazing altars, I'll show you a close-up of the front altar, carved in wood, painted and gold-leafed, with lots and lots of statues. I'm, if you can see the niches, of course, the guy in the centerpiece there would be um, St. Francis Xavier, if I'm not mistaken. And on either side, you would see, I suppose, I, and I don't know at the moment who they are. Of course, when you look at them and you know the iconography, you can, you can tell which saints are which. Um, Mexico is filled with Baroque altarpieces, or retablos, as they're called, um, of this fashion. I mean, these are f fabulous, as you can see the two painted angels up above in the uh, spandrels, as they're called, those little um, areas above the arch. I'll just go back and show you the uh, hole, because there are two fabulous retablos on either side. You can see on the side retablos that the the pillars are, of course, supporting nothing. They're there as decorative, but they stand out from the flat surface, or let's not so flat, but out from the surface of the altar itself. Why is that? To give a sense of depth, to give a sense of movement. What I like to say about these altar pieces, they're, they're like Borges's Aleph. They're meant or Aleph. They're meant to signify the universe. So they want depth, they want movement. These would have been lit with candles, there would have been flickering lights that would have given a sense of, of dynamism to the whole. Um, and then lots and lots of figures. And I'll show you, and the carved figures are very special. This actually happens to be a detail from the majestic altarpiece at, in the Cathedral of Mexico City, which is, of course, the most important Baroque building in Latin America, and certainly 
certainly in Mexico. And you can see, look at all the little angels. There are saints there. There are often um, cherubs, sometimes just heads of, of cherubs. This, the kind of statues that are on altarpieces are called estofados. It's a particular colonial art form carved in wood with billowing capes, you know, as I showed you some of those pictures of the virgins ascending to heaven when we talked about Remedios the Beauty. Um, these might as well, these fellows are a little more static, but oftentimes um, amazing carving that you, you feel for sure that it's, it's actual fabric. I'm going to go back for one moment. Um, and then what, they're, they're polychromed, as it, it said, that's how it's described, poly polychromados, painted with various layers of paint and then hammered so that the fabric looks like brocade. It looks like it has a texture to it. And also the, the ways that the hands and f faces are painted looks like skin. So it's a very particular art form. And of course, some of the statues stood alone, the estofados, as they're called, but many were for altarpieces. This happens in Tepozotlan to be a teeny little side chapel called the Camarín de la Virgen, the dressing room of the Virgin. And um, it has a little, and what that means is when the Virgin statue would be taken out in procession, she, or when the seasons changed, her garb would be, or garbs, dresses would be changed according to the season, according to, to the ecclesiastical calendar. And, but she would be dressed with very, in very loving fashion in this incredibly ornate space. This is the cupola. It's a little teeny tight arched vault where there you see four angels. And they're practically horizontal, those angels. But they look, and I'll show you a close-up of one of them, they look as if they're getting ready to jump off and fly. And I love this particular image because you have the sun on the, uh, on the left, the moon on the right, these little clouds. You can see the naive hand. You can, it, it's naive on a certain level, as high Baroque as this is. Um, it, it doesn't look like 17th century Europe. And if you bother to compare the two, you, you'll have no trouble identifying the New World Baroque for its idiosyncratic details, for its naivete at times, those little clouds and so forth. Um, but what it, there, again, it's this idea of the Aleph. It's all times of day, the sun and the moon shining at the same time, the, the sense of the cosmic infinity of that ceiling, these almost horizontal angels with the, the optical illusion of flying off and upward into space. Now, this, now we go to another one that Carpentier mentions. It's just six lines, eight lines down on a page 100 after we see the reference to Ecatepec, which should be Acatepec. Um, and I don't have pictures of that handy, though I may get you some because I think there are some in our slide library. But then I wanted, he says, he doesn't remember, you can see a famous chapel in Puebla, he says. Well, I know, I know, I know that he's referring to the Capilla del Rosario, the Chapel of the Virgin of the Rosary, which is super famous in New World Baroque architecture uh, for its incredible decorations. I'm just going to show you a few of the decorations, including the one that he mentions, which is the Celestial Concert in white and, and gold. Here you have a mermaid. Now, what on earth is a mermaid doing in a Christian Catholic environment, the Virgin of the Rosary is dear to sailors. And so there are nautical motifs in, virgin, in chapels dedicated to the Virgin of the Rosary, who's a very important virgin. I don't have a picture where she's in the middle in a glass case, incredibly ornate. But uh, for some reason, I'm showing you my, my details of the walls. The walls are encrusted with what is called strap work these pieces of plaster that come out from the wall, and then these odd faces. And I'm going to show you another odd face. And uh, you know, you, you walk and you say, where, where am I? But this is Carpentier's point. This is Carpentier's point. The Baroque allows the other to enter. So that's what he's celebrating here. Now, 
is it true? I mean, this is indigenous labor that was not perhaps wished to be doing something else with their time than building Catholic chapels, though by now this is 18th century. Uh, indigenous population of this area uh, had been largely Christianized. Um, but as I said, those people, Carlos Fuentes is one, Carpentier another, very interested to make a cultural argument which is to praise syncretism, to praise inclusion. And so uh, this is, becomes one of his examples. In fact, his, his last example. Here's the celestial choir that he, or concert that he, uh, he mentions. What does he say? He says, the famous chapel in Puebla, Baroque in white and gold, that strap work is gold that comes out, those pieces from the, you see how it's embossed, the texture is, is, is uh, you know, there are signs there, don't touch because it's such a temptation, all of these things kind of exude, exuding from the walls. Um, where so it says, in white and gold, where a celestial concert appears and angels make their appearance, playing the lute, harps, the clavichord, all the great instruments of the Renaissance. And then he goes on to an Arbol de la Vida in Santo Domingo de Oaxaca. I have to get that on a ceiling, another kind of embossed work here uh, in Mexico. So that's Puebla, the city of Puebla across the volcanoes from Mexico City to the east, a city of about three and a half or four million. Um, people don't know it's a fabulous city if you get a chance to visit. Now let's go back to his page, to Carpentier's page 98, where he's talking about Teotihuacan. It's about ten lines up, the head of Quetzalcoatl. It's the last paragraph. Aztec sculpture could never be seen as classical sculpture. Think of the great heads of Quetzalcoatl at Teotihuacan. Think of the ornaments of the temples. It's Baroque. Of course it's Baroque, with its geometries of both straight and curved lines, its particular fear of empty spaces. There is almost never even a meter of empty surface in an Aztec temple. Here are close-ups of these two heads that you saw in another shot, Quetzalcoatl and Tlaloc. Tlaloc on our right, with those eyes and jaws. The plumed serpent is on the left. How do we know? See that what looks like a little frilly collar? Those are to be his. Those are his feathers. And look at the undulating surface beneath his head, Quetzalcoatl's. That's part of the body of a snake. I'll show you another slide in a minute where you'll see it. That snakes along the front of, or the facade of a pyramid. Um, why plumed serpent? Why? Because the snake is of the ground, the bird is of the air, the plumed serpent is the god of the earth and the god of the air. Again, that idea of inclusion, that, that attempt to say it all. Here you see this plumed serpent snaking along. You see on each of the levels, in between the rectangular boxes is the head of a snake and then the body that goes along. And the body isn't smooth. Those are supposed to be uh, feathers. So the plumed serpent was one of the great gods of the various cultures of both Maya and Nahua peoples in Mesoamerica. Um, books are written on Quetzalcoatl, uh, but for now I guess we just want to follow Carpentier's argument. He says, ah, what's more Baroque than this? He says, this is just as Baroque as that retablo, that altarpiece in Tepozotlan, at which point my students in Mexico say, no, wait a minute, that's not really quite true. This is Aztec and the other 17th century. But nonetheless, for the sake of argument, let's, well, let's, let's understand Carpentier's argument. And we're going to understand what's at stake here. Why does he want to make this argument? Here is the goddess of death, as he puts it, uh, a dozen lines down on page 99. Um, it's coatlique, which means serpent skirt. Did you get that? Quetzalcoatl, that same coat, meaning serpent in Nahuatl. I don't speak Nahuatl, but I know a few words. Um, Quetzalcoatl, Quetzal is the bird, and coatl is the snake. The Quetzal bird now extinct with beautiful turquoise long tail feathers. So um, a particular bird. And then coat, liqui, coat, snake. And liqui, I guess, is skirt because she is um, 
hang on, we'll go back a minute here. She is, has a serpent skirt. Look at the hands and hearts on a big necklace that has a pendant or a belt buckle of a skull. And you see the hands and then these things that look a little like hand grenades. Um, and then another pair of hands. Those are hearts. This refers to her, it refers to the practice of human sacrifice in Mesoamerican culture. Um, and why was that practice engaged in to keep the world going on. So when you see something that refers to human sacrifice in Aztec or Mesoamerican iconography generally, what you know is it's a reference to both life and death. There's sacrificial victim in order that the sun should be nourished by the heart of that sacrificial victim. So it's a bit the opposite of our own important myth of a God's sacrifice, namely Christ, that the God sacrifices himself so that man should live. This is the opposite. Men are sacrificed so that the gods can keep, will keep the earth going, going round. Then he mentions Mitla, and you can even see the sign. This is an indigenous site in um, Oaxaca, and it's the 99, the second to last short paragraph, he actually mentions Mitla above, and he compares this kind of fretwork, as it's called. See those little decorations? You'll see them closer up in a minute. Um, those are pieces of stone that are fit together to make geometric patterns, and he compares this kind of work to the Diabelli's um, vari 33 variations uh, of, on Diabelli's theme by Beethoven. And then in, he also mentions Schoenberg's variations. So the music of a fugue, where you have a tune and then the tune begins to vary, variations on a theme. Well, you can say he's just making all this up, this carpentier. He just says anything that comes in his mind. He compares anything to anything. True, that's true. But somehow we want to see why, and then we want to see how it works in his fiction. Um, so here, what he's trying to say is, let's not think of history as diachronic, that this was then, and then Diavelli's variations by Beethoven is now, or at least was a later period. All of these things constitute a human spirit, which we can call Baroque. Movement, dynamism, variation, and so forth. I just thought I'd end by showing you a couple magnificent sculptures of Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl is represented in paint, in ceramics, in stone, what other media, others, no doubt, uh, a million trillion times. There are millions of images to this day. This, this one is in a German museum, but I think it's particularly stunning. You know it's Quetzalcoatl and not a bird by that little mermaid tail beard. It's a bit weird. It are his fangs. Those, that's the fangs, that little thing that shoots out of the mouth of a snake. He also has the teeth, but you see, other than that, he looks like a bird, all those feathers, except he's coiled like a snake. So it's a kind of a remarkable piece of sculpture. And you'll remember that I showed you Bernini's Saint, Saint Teresa. It's mentioned by Carpentier. The movement, the dynamism, and then another stunning example. Look at the leg and the arm. You see the leg in the front there? By this time, Quetzalcoatl is also portrayed as a person, as a man. So you have a combination of bird, snake, and self, human self. And so you see the snake's mouth, the fangs, but the he human head coming out of the jaws. Do you see the, how the jaws are open and the head is looking out? We see our little forked um, goatee here. Those are the fangs underneath the human chin. And all of that, of course, in ra wrapped with feathers. And so, so when, when Carpentier says everything is everything, and you look at a statue like this and you say, well, yeah, I guess he's on to something. Bird, snake, man in a most fabulous uh, construction or composition, let's say. Then one final. This is Sans Souci, the palace of Paul P Pauline Bonaparte in Haiti, the ruins of it. It's a contemporary photo. And remember that that is also mentioned. In fact, if you'll turn, if you brought your book to page 86, 87, uh, you'll remember that he mentions the, the palace of when he went, first went to uh, Haiti. And I think it's actually earlier. Let's see, one sec. 84, thank you. It's the bottom, right? 
Where? Right in the middle. Oh, right in the middle. Okay, Paula, yes, thank you. Very middle of 84, thank you. Um, my encounter with Paula, Pauline Bonaparte there, so far from Corsica, remember Bonaparte came from Corsica, was a revelation to me. I saw the possibly, uh, possibility of establishing, oh, I'm going to go back the possibility of establishing synchronisms. See these, here in Haiti, you see France. <laughs> you see the, the, the Napoleonic Revolution in the jungle. So he makes, as you know, in the, in the novel, if you've gotten that far, and I hope you have, um, he, he makes quite, quite a point of this setting, this weird idea of Pauline Bonaparte's European outpost in, in Haiti. So with that, I think we'll quit looking at our pictures and we'll look at our text. Any comments on that or questions? Have you gotten into Alejo Carpentier's novel? Naturally, I have two copies. Does anybody have this or am I the only one? You all have the newer edition. Okay, with this is an easy one because there are lots of short chapters, so we can refer to uh, chapter numbers. But while you have your her anthologies open, if you do, to page 84, I did want to look at what he says. Now that you've read the novel, it's actually 86 we need to go to, he refers, remember this last part of our first essay, Marvelous Real in America, is the preface in 1949 to the kingdom of this world. So he says things about the novel in the essay, and I just thought since now we've gotten a good look at the novel, we can go back to what he said. And then I want to show you that most, I'm going to go straight to the most famous passage in the novel, which is the killing of Makandal, the burning, the execution of him and how it's understood in two very different ways at the very same time by different consumers of the events. And that's what he's alluding to here. So just if you don't have your book, I'll just remind you of his introduction to this magical reel or I guess we should use his term marvelous reel uh, world. This seemed particularly obvious to me during my stay in Haiti, where I found myself in daily contact with something that could be defined as the marvelous real. I was in a land where thousands of men anxious for freedom believed in Makandal's lycanthropic like, like powers. We learned last time that the werewolves, the a possibility of becoming a wolf is what that means, lycanthropic powers. <coughs> to the extent that their collective faith produced a miracle on the day of his execution. We'll see it. I had already heard the prodigious story of Bukman, the Jamaican initiate. We're going to see him too. I had been in the citadel of La Ferrière, a work without architectural precedent, and its forerunner Piranesi's imaginary prisons. If anybody wants to look into Piranesi in your web projects, I know you're all set on your web projects, but, um, and if you're not, please catch me after class, but um, that Piranesi's reference here is interesting. I breathed in the atmosphere created by Henri Henri Christophe, a, a monarch of incredible zeal, much more surprising than all of the cruel kings invented by the surrealists, and so forth. So here we have this, the scene is set in the introduction, and now let's look at it. Just go down to the very bottom of page 87, and I'll read you one more word about Makandal before we look at him. It's six lines up from the bottom of 87. Yet in America, where nothing like this has been written, Makanda lived and is, was endowed with the same powers by the faith of his contemporaries, who with his magic fomented one of the strangest and most dramatic uprisings in history. So this is the fascination this, of Haiti and of, especially of Makanda. So let's, if you don't mind, we'll just go straight to that passage because it's so important. And since we don't have class on Thursday, what I'd like to do is after your web projects are done and when we see each other next here um, on November 2nd, um, 
I'd like you to bring this novel back because we aren't going to do it justice. You know, get on with the reading as it's um, as it's outlined in the the syllabus. And in fact, you may have extra time, as I said. I think on your syllabus we have some important novels coming up and long ones after the web project, so you'll have a chance to catch up on your reading or get ahead on your reading, I hope. But in the meantime, bring this one back too, because we can't do uh, justice to it. And in fact, in about 15 minutes, if everything goes according to plan, Mary Gray and Sabrina Marsh are going to come and talk to you a little bit about the, the web project. They're going to be your two main advisors in that enterprise. So I'm rushing a bit for that reason as well. But look, will you, and I'm going to do it in my my book. Let's see. What do you have on 53? I'll look in a sec. 53, 53. Oh, we have the same page numbers. That's good. Um, would you look at 51, please? Or 50, where this scene of Makandal's miraculous escape is recounted. Who, who wants to walk us through this? Do you, do you remember how this goes? Like how he's burned at the stake? Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Um, what, what goes on here? And we'll read some of it, but we, it's a bit longish. Tell us, Chris. They've brought all the slaves into the quarters mm -hmm. of the compound. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're surrounded by soldiers and people to keep the, the crowd yeah. uh, in, in control. They have uh, people on top who are going to who are setting up the the faggots to burn. Yeah, and yeah, uh, they have. He's going to be burned at the stake. Uh huh. They have Mackendall uh, tied up or up there, and they tie him up. And he, whenever they are setting the fire on, mm -hmm. he uh, loosens his his stub of his one arm. Yes, he's And um, he gets out that way. And mm -hmm. then when the flames are kissing his feet, he turns into a fly or. Mm -hmm. Is it a fly? It is a fly. Well, it? he flies away, at least we know. <laughs> we'll, we'll read it carefully. Yeah, he, he escapes. Yeah, I think you're right, too. It's mentioned that he goes into insect form quite a lot. That's right. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, like in, in all that because of uh, the past of him, you know, setting the, the fungus and on the stones and killing all the animals and the plantation owners and everything. Mm -hmm. So this is the punishment, and he gets away in that way, but then uh, everyone revolts instantaneously, and there's chaos and mm -hmm. pandemonium and they uh, they come down onto the slaves and put everybody back in order but amidst all the chaos they don't recognize that uh, he's been thrown back in the flame and mm -hmm. they hear his last yell and so uh, you have the two interpretations of of, uh, of this because of the reaction by the slaves mm -hmm. um, being jubilant that they had the upper hand in the end because mm -hmm. he performed his magic and once again uh, the the white folks fell to the uh, to the the errors of their own god by not recognizing the gods uh, of their own uh, Ivory Coast, yeah. and then uh, as a result of that, um, celebrating and the white folks seeing it and saying they don't even have any remorse for their hero. I know. Oh, well, this just uh, concludes our idea of barbarism of these people and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Th that's. So these two scenes are two readings of the same scene, basically, which we could say, well, they're, you know, even when sometimes there's a misunderstanding between us and a friend, let's say, or between us and a, and a boyfriend or a girlfriend, we say, well, look, we were seeing the same thing, but we interpreted it differently. I understood it this way, you understood it that way. It's the nature of misunderstanding. But this is cultural misunderstanding, misunderstanding on a cultural level. And it's, wha it's, it's what is interesting in, I think, the Carpentier theory of Latin American identity. Not only that the misunderstandings exist, but the multiplicity exists. So that there are always going to be tensions that two different things can be absolutely true at once, and those two things can be contradictory. So it's not, he's saying there's a certain kind of, if not, it's a different kind of reason. I won't say it's irrational. It's a different kind of reason that encompasses. And so, so he really is the first to do this in 1949. He gets it, I think, from the surrealists, the very guys that he's saying, oh, the laboratories of the imagination. But one of the important aspects of surrealism is to juxtapose opposites. And it's and a, a sewing machine and an umbrella, you know, and so, or, uh, the, the idea of putting together opposites and creating a shock. But he says, oh, well, they just stage it. In, in the new world, we have cultures that are opposites, that are operating 
at the same time. So this notion of, if you want, um, certainly syncretism, but also cr um, productive creative tensions of entire cultures. Now we can say this is a pretty grotesque scene to be making that point, uh, an African leader burned at the stake. And that's also part of Carpentier's uh, point, I think. So let's just look at it. If you would look at page 50, I, I think it's important that we do more than paraphrase it. Here comes our troops. Come right in. We're going to look at one passage, Mary and Sabrina, and then we're going to cede the floor to you. Yay, I'm so glad to see you. Um, OK, let's just look at the middle of page 50. At a given moment, all the fans snapped shut. There was a great silence behind the military drums. Makandal, his waist girded by striped pants, bound with ropes and knots, his skin gleaming with recent wounds, was moved toward the center of the square. The master's eyes questioned the faces of the slaves, but the Negroes showed spiteful indifference. What did the whites know of Negro matters? In his cycle of metamorphoses, now you see here, the narrator is giving us the perspective of the indigenous, well, of the African po population. In his cycle of metamorphoses, Makandal had often entered the mysterious world of the insects, making up for the lack of his human arm with the possession of several feet, four wings, or long antennae. He had been a fly, centipede, moth, ant, tarantula, ladybug, even a glowworm with phosphorescent green lights. That's not reported as that's what those guys think. It's reported as that's the fact, right? When the moment came, the bonds of the Mandinge, no longer possessing a body to bind, would trace the shape of a man in the air for a second before they slipped down the post. You see, this is still the perspective of the Africans watching their leader. The shape of that man is still there, but that's not Makandal. And Makandal, transformed into a buzzing mosquito, that's what, would light on the very tricorn of the commander of the troops to laugh at the dismay of the whites. This was what their masters did not know. For that reason, they had squandered so much money putting on this useless show, which would prove how completely helpless they were against a man chrismed by the great Loas. So the, the Africans are laughing. The whites are saying, those people don't have any sense at all. They aren't even sorry that their leader is dying. The Africans in Haiti are laughing at the whites because they haven't got a clue that this man has just flown away. <laughs> Makandal was now lashed to the post. The, ex the executioner had picked up an ember with the tongs. You see, now we're back to the, the real, if you want, the white, the realistic, the rational. This is what really happened. With a gesture rehearsed the evening before in front of the mirror, the governor unsheathed his dress sword and gave the order for the sentence to be carried out. The fire began to rise toward the Mandinge, licking his legs. At that moment, Makandal moved the stump of his arm, which had been, he had been, able, they had been unable to tie up in a threatening gesture that was nonetheless terrible for being partial, howling unknown spells and violently thrusting his torto forward. The bonds fell off and the body of the Negro rose in the air, just flipped, just flipped perspective until it plunged into the black waves of the sea of slaves. A single cry filled the canvas. Makandal saved. Pandemonium followed. And then we don't need to continue reading, but now the real death. Again, back to the European perspective. This man, his head is down in the fire. His hair is burning. So it's a, it's a horrible, grotesque scene, but what's interesting, just the very last paragraph on 52, the, that afternoon the slaves returned to their plantations laughing all the way. Makandal had kept his word, remaining in the kingdom of this world. Once more the whites had been outwitted by the mighty powers of the other shore and so forth. So I leave it to you to notice these kinds of cultural contradictions that are presented as compliments. It's not either or, it's both and. And that's what, that's what Carpentier's point is here. And that's for him what the New World Baroque allows. Is this Baroque writing? Well, we can talk about that next time. <laughs> um, first, we have to meet our um, instructors, not first, first and last. Um, so Mary and Sabrina, and I haven't met you, Sabrina, hi. Hello.
thank you so much for coming. Come up here and get on screen. <laughs> I understand from Anthony that all but four of our numbers in this class are now signed up with their spaces. And I've spoken to all four people where there's a little confusion about names and Cougarnet IDs. But it seems like we're progressing according okay. to plan. So yes, I leave it to you. And I was just saying that she was going to <laughs> rattle yes. Anthony's cage. <laughs> right, right. Well, he's rattling mine. And I just, <laughs> Anne is one, and Jacob is one. And it's a question going right across the hall. And then I told them to email Anthony. I mean, I wonder, shall we, I mean, who knows whether we'll do this again. Maybe we will. So let's just record this. Yes, excuse me. I'm going to give my microphone to I'm going to give my microphone to you. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> I'm Mary Gray. This is Sabrina Marsh. This is Sabrina, Sabrina Marsh. I'm fourth year PhD in the English department. I teach uh, freshman English. I teach a computers in the humanities class this Saturday during this, the weekend college. Sabrina is, in fact, the high priestess of front page <laughs> <laughs> who, who helps us Unofficial. on Saturday and has helped us in the past. So. She knows all of the questions before you ask them and will know all of the answers for certain. Hopefully. So, a week from today, we'll be seeing all of you over at the Writing Center. Everybody knows where that is? Room 211. We have 25 computers in there. How many? We may top 25 a bit, but usually around 23, 24. Okay, and we will be crammed in there because it's one of the tinier rooms, so we will be elbow to elbow. You will know your neighbor. But we do have 25 computers in there. Uh, by the time that you come to class, I guess Dr. Zamora has explained, you will have everything in place so that when you show up on uh, next Tuesday, we'll have everything to sign in. You'll be all set up with your page. And I'm assuming that everyone's got a topic. I'm assuming this is the magical realism class from what I heard. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's just wonderful. <laughs> so think about coming with as much done as you can have done, because we're going to have six hours. A to Tuesday, make a website. A Tuesday, Thursday, a Tuesday, Thursday. <laughs> and that's not difficult to do if you have your content. And your, your graphics. And if you've decided on some images that you want to use to illustrate your argument. Uh, this is kind of a different animal. This is not the essay. This is, it's visual rhetoric, really. And think about when you. Mary, have Sabrina stick that on your collar. I'm wondering if Goodbye? Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, think of this as visual rhetoric. It's a visual argument. Think of when you go to a website. You're Googling around and you hit a website and it looks like it's going to be great, but here's the screen and here's the bar way up here which tells you there's going to be a whole lot of scrolling going on. And if it's just a lot of text, are you going to read it? <laughs> Absolutely not. And neither is your reader. You're working for a different audience now. In academia, the normal course of events is that you write up to someone like Dr. Zamora or someone who's an expert in the field who's going to read your prose. In this animal, you know more about your topic than anyone else out there on the web. You are the authority. And so what you have to do now is to write down to that audience who's going to look at your page and always think about that viewer on the other end. Are they going to understand what I'm telling them? Is it going to be clear? Is it going to be interesting? And when you get out in the real world of your professions, those of you who aren't going to be complete dorks like me and Dr. Zamora <laughs> and become, uh, uh, yeah, 
that's what you're going to do. Whether you're writing the report, whether you're writing the case study, whether you're writing the proposal, you're going to be writing from a perspective where you know more about the subject than anyone else and you have to transmit that information. So different kind of animal. Think about what images can I use that will bolster my argument. Uh, you're writing an argumentative text. It's not really an essay, but you are making an argument. Dr. Zamora has asked you to lay out a claim, to lay out a thesis. And what Stephen Tolman, the philosopher, tells us is that argument is a claim supported by reasons and evidence. So think about what images are going to bolster that argument. If I'm Joe X viewer out there and have Googled you up, what am I going to want to know about this thing? What's going to make me see it better? Is it going to be a painting? Is it going to be a map? You know, many of you probably have topics that a map is going to help somebody anchor themselves. Uh, so think of it as visual. Dr. Zamora has asked you to have three screens, right? So kind of, this, the, the, it's not the essay, it's another animal. Think, where's the logical breakpoint where I want to send my viewer to the next page? Click here for more, and we'll teach you how to do that. It's not hard. Uh, where's the logical breakpoint? Where are things going to shake out so that I have three screens that make sense? OK? Uh, Sabrina, why don't you talk for a minute, and I'm going to hand them out. Sure, but I thought I'd just give it to you in hard copy today. This is my best tips for citing electronic sources and web pages because many of you will be using electronic sources in your paper. This is my own little class. <laughs> While uh, Mary passes that out, my name is Sabrina Marsh and I'm a doctoral student first year. Uh, I got my master's degree in instructional technology, and I'm getting my doctorate degree in a combination of computers and um, like social history. So I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I did a little bit of both. And uh, how many of you have actually used front page before to create a website? Has anybody? Just one person? Has anybody used HTML? OK. Because the version of front page we're using, it's not a template. You have to create it all, but you don't have to write the code, if you all know what I'm talking about, the HTML code. You don't have to write the code. You put it onto a page. You can copy and paste. You can insert pictures. So if you come with your content and come with your graphics already down, you're way ahead of the game. I don't think you can do it in six hours if you have to search for everything. I don't, there's no way. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a lot of pressure on you because literally this will be open to the world. Everybody will be looking at your web pages. And so it's, it's a lot of fun. It's very creative. I don't think there are any limitations except for three pages and what, a certain number of graphics? Yeah. And, you know, well, Mary, you're the expert, but we said three because we want something really coherent. But mm -hmm. if somebody's got three coherent pages and wants to add five more, it's sure. Yeah. So really, in a way, we're, we're citing minimum requirements mm -hmm. set of skills. Yeah. Uh, three images, I believe, uh, links and to an external website. Uh -huh. uh, I believe we're going to put alt tags on our images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, alt tags are the things when you roll the mouse over it, the little bar pops up that tells you what that image is. And uh, it'll... Oh, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the director. I, just, <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> I've been telling students all, all semester. Do you think I remember now? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. If oh. we out here say something, we have to press a button. Oh, okay. That would freak me out yeah. so bad. <laughs> <laughs> this class has been great. They're very nice about contributing, even though they're being recorded. I really appreciate it. So I think what you guys can do to get kind of ahead of the game, since we have a short window to create this really nice website, is get all your content that you can. And literally, like Mary said, be thinking about how to break it up into three sections. And I, I hope all of you realize, like on regular web pages, you can scroll down, scroll down. You can make one page as long as you want. But keep in mind that your viewer is probably not going to want to read just text after text after text. I mean, when you go to a website, don't you like it to be broken up with images and 
you know, so think about that. And I would say bring it on a jump drive. Do y'all know what those are, those little jump sticks? Mm. Does anybody have one? You got one? You can bring it on a floppy, yeah. Those little, uh, yeah, bring it on CD, bring it on a floppy. And uh, we'll just copy and paste it over into your website. And Sabrina, someone in my other class suggested that you could also email it to yourself and then open your email in the uh, writing center. It, mm -hmm. That's you know, an idea too. I didn't think about that. Everyone will have other yeah. ways of doing it, I think, mm -hmm. too, but that was an interesting suggestion. That's a, a very interesting idea. Yeah. That's a good idea. And as far as I know, Anthony is making it where you can work on it at home. So if any of you have a version of front page at home, you can open it up at home and work on it too. I'll check with Anthony on that. Cause um, Sabrina, we, we did advise everyone for seven dollars to go to Cougar Byte and mm -hmm. get a program just because you know you don't have to you can go to the writing lab but since we're learning the skills we might as well have the program mm -hmm. at home to put up other mm -hmm. websites so yeah. I think mainly people will have the capacity to work at home. From okay that now. sounds good but go to Cougar Byte and tell them you want the version of front page 2003 that's what the writing center uses and at seven dollars you need to take your Cougar ID card to show them that you're a student. And you can't get a better deal. That's a wonderful deal for $7. And it's so much fun. We'll have a blast playing around with colors and fonts and making things jump around. It's a lot of fun. Are you allowed to use that just after you As far as I know, somebody had told me that you can only buy one copy of it. Yeah, wherever it's installed, it's installed forever. But I, I don't see how they can keep you from using it after you graduate. Oh, yeah. See, I don't know how Anthony's setting it up. I think he's setting it on your Cougar One card account. Is that right? We, you're all set except for the four of you that I talked to because your ID in the web course is usually your Cougar Net ID. They're usually the same, but in four cases whom I've talked to, the uh, I, ID for this course didn't pull up the Cougar Net ID. Hmm. So you're all set, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about somebody else going into your folders. As far as I know, Anthony's setting it up where you're the only person that can get into your folders. So it should be really fun. I think it's going to be great. Anybody have questions for our... They probably don't know <laughs> enough to, uh, to figure out what to you know, ask Damon's if they haven't gonna, used front Damon's page. Damon's going to help us, I think, because he does. Anything we should be saying that we aren't here that you think of? Can, can you think of anything else? Yeah, if you, if you all know front page, by all means, feel free to help me. If you're comfortable with Word, you can do front page. It's mm -hmm. very easy to do, don't you think? It's very easy. Who had a question? A uh, cougar bite. It's um, in the UC, you know where the Wendy's is? It's directly under there. And I think the guy that's usually there that runs it, his name is Aaron. He's real nice. For seven bucks. <laughs> but if you ask for the Windows or the Microsoft Office, it's not a part of that. The front page isn't. For some reason, it's a separate uh, disk, a, di a separate CD. So if you ask for Microsoft Office, which is like $21, that's a really good deal too, but you'll also have to ask for front page. I don't know why they gave them separately. Mary, do you want to talk about your handout? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I've given you is, uh, like I said, my little handout that we use in the Saturday class. But since so many of you now will be going to web resources, uh, either for your text, probably all of you for your images, this is a little go-by sheet. And as I say, welcome to the completely frustrating and confusing world because the modes of information transfer have so outrun the rules. By the time you get an M MLA handbook and hard copy, it's it's a dinosaur. So what I've tried, I always try to do is keep scanning, 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 and try to find the most up-to-date 
websites, and this one comes from uh, Diana Hacker at Bedford St. Martin's. And what this does will kind of lead you through some problems that will come up. You'll go, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? Well, here, here are some answers. Um, when you cite a website, I've given you the order in which your citation appears. Author, last name first, name of the article in quotation marks, name of the web page in italics, date of some websites will give you when they last updated, some, some websites will not, name of the sponsoring institution, if you've got it, you may not, you know, PBS, University of Houston, you may, it may be there, it may not, and then the date you looked at it, and then the URL in angle brackets. The date you like, looked at it is very important because someone Googling you out there a year and a half from now may try to find this thing and it will have disappeared. So you always need to have the date of access. You know when you write your wonderful MLA papers and you do your work cited, you double space your uh, work cited and you do a hanging indent for the second and third lines of your entries, front page will not let you do that. It will stop its feet and will not let you do that hanging indent. So, the, the MLA has finally, ding dong, light bulb has come on and realized that a lot of people are working in front page and uh, the MLA has said grace over the fact that you do not have to do that hanging indent anymore. You can single space your entries. You can, in fact, even bullet them if you want to. So that's why my little examples are single spaced. And the rule to go by is see what you've got in that web page and if you don't have one of those items you just omit it and go to the next one. Many websites will not give you an author. You'll just have the title of the web, the web page. Which is something for you to think about when you use your sources to think about those EDU sites, those ORG sites that are going to be stable and are going to be there a year and a half from now when somebody Googles you up and wants to look at it. Uh, and I know since you're upper class, you all know all this part about you know doing the wonderful in-text parenthetical citations that we're speaking the same language there. <laughs> and I, for, my, for my first semester freshman, I had to lay this out, lay this out for, for them. Uh, images that come from websites, almost all of you are going to be doing this. Here's the way we go. Artist, last name first, just like an author. Identify the image, the name of the image. If it's a photograph, it's in quotation marks. The paintings are uh, in italics. Oh, one thing I forgot to tell you about the web page being in italics. If you go to the MLA book, it's going to tell you to underline the name of the website. Well, the light bulb also came on to the great gods at MLA, and uh, they've understood now that when you write your URL, it's going to go hot on you in Word, and it's going to be underlined. So to avoid the confusion, the name of your web page is now in italics because that URL is going to go hot on you, right? It's going to go blue, and it's going to go hot. So back to the images. <laughs> Uh, identify the image, the date that it was done, if you've got it, if you've got a painting, probably will have it, photograph, maybe, maybe not, you know, some kind of graphic map or something, you probably won't have that. And then you literally say, online image. And that tells your reader that this is my citation for that image. And then the rest of it is just like uh, the former one, name of the web page in italics, date of posting, name of sponsoring institution, date of access, and your URL in angle brackets. And there are two examples of paintings, and then some examples of just images or photographs. And you can see how your viewer is going to understand that those are, that those are images. Uh, and at the bottom I say, if, do, Im, have any of you done Google image searches? Do y'all do? those. Have you noticed, or if you haven't actually had to cite one, when you do the Google image search, the URL at the top of your screen is going to go all the way across that bar and it's going to keep going places you can't even see and when you go to cut and paste it, it's going to be five lines long, the URL is. So 
when you do that Google search, it's always going to say original context of this image is, and it's going to show you that web page. That's the one to use. That's the one that's going to be shorter. So. And where will it say that? I've not noticed that. Where does it, it says it on the screen? Uh -huh. I see. Thank you. It pulls it up. It'll pull up the image in the thumbnail, and then it'll say underneath it, original context of this ad is or this image is. That's right. And yeah. it'll have the little URL, and if you scroll down, that page will be pulled up for you. Uh-huh. Thank you. Right. Now, now <laughs> yeah. let me say it. Yeah. It, does, it does tell you that. Uh, so use that. And my best advice to you is all of this junk, the really bothersome, even though I've been recording, pain in the butt stuff, <laughs> do ahead of time. If you, can, if you know where your images are, and you can get your work cited set up, it is the most wonderful feeling <laughs> when you type that last word of text and you do that grammar check and you do that spell check that that work cited page is done. <laughs> it's a great feeling. Uh, front page will not let you grammar check. will spell check for you, but will not let you grammar check. So how are we going to do that? We're going to cut and paste it into a Word doc, your text, and use the grammar check there uh, and do the word uh, count there. Front page will not let you word count. It will spell check for you, but it won't do the word count. So that just, yes. So the work cited are going to be on a whole page by themselves. That's up to you. Okay. That's up to you. Sometimes, you know, you may want to when you get to that third page, say, click here for work cited or or you may, it may fall where you want to just put it at the end of the last page you're working on and just set it up like you would in a normal MLA paper, work cited, and then it follows. So that's up to you. Is that acceptable to have the third page, the work cited page? I wouldn't think it would be the whole third page. But I'm end. still so paper oriented that I can kind of imagine it at the end of the website just there. Uh, um, that would suit me fine if it were just at the bottom of yeah. the third page. Of the third page. Um, but maybe somebody will decide to do footnotes rather than end notes. You never know. I mean, maybe you, you'll, you'll play with it. But yet, speaking of all of the documentation, I, I will say also that I am encouraging people to add books to their work. Yes, site. we do have a library called the Anderson Library. <laughs> yes, it's true. We forget. <laughs> <laughs> and at the bottom of this handout is uh, also a, a, a site for traditional essays that's very good. Uh, that when you, you go to that, it will give you MLA, APA, Chicago, and you've got a place to click for a sample paper for each one of those styles. So you can click on a sample MLA paper. I, I always think I can write anything if I can see what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> you know, because you always have to think about that end product, what it's going to look like. And Mary, where is that? Sorry, I missed on, on page three okay. for your traditional essays okay. using Word. I call them the horse and buggy essays. I actually had somebody in the last, the spring class when we did uh, five web projects and two traditional papers on the student comments say they wanted more horse and buggy papers. <laughs> well, that was unusual. <laughs> That's what I call them. Yes. Did you say we're the first group to do this or have you done it before? You're, you're the first group to do kind of this, but yes, we've done it. Uh, we're doing it now, uh, and we've done it in the spring. Mm -hmm. you, we're, yeah, we can surely give you some links to Yeah, we'll show some. some examples from the spring. and, and uh, that now? I mean, well, are we wired where we can do that? If not, we can. Uh, you, maybe you could just give people the address the, of the site yeah, where they can okay. check. Okay. On okay. HTTP. Uh, <laughs> colon slash slash. Discovery. Dot C O E. Dot U H. Dot E D U. Slash. Syllabus. Does it have to be linked to FO4? Ooh, it sure does. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Discovery.co.uh.edu slash linked FO4. Ooh, thank you. Instead of syllabus. 
-hmm. slash syllabus, slash and then syllabus. and then syllabus no, follows. Do it, do it one more time, Mary. Uh, HTTP colon slash slash discovery dot c o e dot u h dot e d u slash linked zero four f zero four. I always forgot the f. Mm -hmm slash syllabus. That will take you to the home page that we're working on now and you can click on that it's called student index. They've just done one little small project. Uh, for last spring where you can see some more complicated things, it's it's on discovery. It's, dis also. it's discovery, it's http discovery.coe uh edu slash webscapes that's one word w e b s c a p e s and if you scroll down that page that's going to give you links to lots of different projects it's called places in time and when you get to that page it'll say student projects you can click on and I think it's a great idea. I learned a lot when I visited with Mary in the writing center and saw the kinds of projects that the freshman group was doing. It, it's illuminating. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you asked that. You'll, you'll get some kind of range of the kind of creativity you can go with. I mean, we don't want these to look like Times New Roman essay, here's a picture. I mean, you don't. We want them to be interesting and, and fun and, you know, grab grab people's attention, and most of all, educational. You guys are the teachers here. You know more about whatever you're talking about than, not Dr. Zamora, but <laughs> everybody else, certainly more than me, certainly more than Sabrina. Oh, yeah. I, I still can't do citations. I'm married. <laughs> well, I think we all do. I mean, I certainly still grab for, uh, when we were in class on Saturday, I had to stop the presses. I thought, wait, somebody is going to, the question is going to come up, how do I cite Dr. Mintz's lectures? Okay, I think I can kind of walk my way through it, but we had to look it up, you know. It's just, yeah. you got to grab for the, stuff and this is these are real good uh, resources for you to do that they're the most up-to-date that I found any other questions for Mary and Sabrina we'll go by first names if that's that's all great right. that's um, great we also have two undergraduates who are techies who will be in there to help us and who is who is this here Damon and it's gonna be a big help good so I think if, if page two right yeah, and Sean has done, and also Amy, I think, raised her hand for the I've done HTML. HTML. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. But it's just come with the content as much as close to being finished with the content as you can, and we'll be able to get done. And if for some reason you are abducted by aliens or the metro bus runs over you next Tuesday, we're going to have Sabrina has some terrific tutorials that will be up on Tuesday. Everything that we're going to do on Tuesday will be up on your Vista site. So don't go into a rigor. Uh, let me give you my email. You know, they, ha <laughs> they have your email on, I mean, do it again, but the emails of our four instructors are oh, they're on all, they're the up. sheet that I put. They're on the w our website and they're also or our Vista site, and they're also in the hard copy that I handed out to you on Thursday, so. Okay, <laughs> then you know where we are. And we're religious about checking our emails. You will hear from us. Thank you so <laughs> much. This is great. Well, I'll see you Tuesday. We'll rock and roll. <laughs>